of worship service. My friends, today we're beginning a new sermon series. I'm excited about it. I hope it's a blessing to you. And as we begin today, I want to pause one more time. You can't have too much prayer. Let's, let's thank the Lord for being here with us. Lord God, I thank you for being a God who is present. That when we gather, you promise to be here. Lord, I pray that as we open up just the first couple of verses of your word today, I pray that you speak to us, that our hearts and our minds would be receptive to your transforming truth. Amen. Today we'll be looking at two verses in the book of Genesis, chapter 1. Genesis 1 and 2. And by way of introduction, let me tell you a story. One of the most formative, there are many things that are formative for us growing up, but one of the most significant and formative things for me as a young teenager, as a middle teenager, was when I was uh, blessed to work at a youth camp. I was hired as a wrangler. Though I had only ridden horses a dozen or so times, I loved horses, and I always had. And so I was hired as a wrangler, and I learned on the job. And in my second summer at this youth camp, our, our head wrangler acquired an apple leaf stock. And it's very similar to this one. It has the larger spots, not just the spec ring, but the, the larger spots all over it. His name was Nemo. Nemo the Appaloosa. And now Nemo was a big horse. At least 15-2, maybe 15-3 hands tall. You know, hand, uh, hand is four inches and you, you measure the horse. It's, it's, it's quite a process to measure four fingers. No, it's not how you do it, is it, Patty? You don't go four fingers at a time. But that's how they measure um, measure four inches each each in each hand is four inches and he was at least 14, 15, 2, or 15, 3, uh, close to 16, but I don't think he was quite that tall. Big boned horse, but he was not young. He had soft eyes. He was friendly. And the first time I saddled and I mounted him, I, I knew he was different. He was special. He knew stuff. You know, when you get on a horse, and the horse knows more than you do? That's what this was like. Not in a bad way. This horse had more experience than I did. What's this guy's story, I asked my boss, the head wrangler. He had purchased him for the camp horsemanship program that spring. And it, it turned out Nemo wasn't young, like I said, and for a horse, he was at least Ah, between 20 and 25 years old. And this was back in around 97, so he'd been around a while. It turns out, as we explored this path, that Nemo had been used as a parade horse, carrying cowboys and dignitaries and celebrations and processions. Nemo had been well-trained, but, but he had been trained in a bygone era. I don't want to get too technical, but, but when you're training a horse to turn, these days you typically teach them to bend around your inside leg while shifting your outside leg back slightly. And you get them to, to bend around that leg. Animo had been taught to turn via pressure from the outside leg. Not bend, but push. This understanding of Nemo's path how he had learned, where he had come from, helped me understand and helped me work with him. Understanding beginnings is history. In order to understand something, you have to know its history, its background, its beginning. This is true in many areas. It's true of people. It's true of organizations. It's true of buildings and relationships. It's true of the human race. And it's true of this earth. Knowing where things come from helps us understand them. And it helps us know how to relate to them. 
over the next few months, in, a, in this new year and into this new year, we'll be exploring a series of teachings on the first three chapters of Genesis. We'll call it the creation series. So we will go a bit beyond just creation. We'll be exploring Adam and Eve's story as well. But today, we're looking at Genesis chapters 1, chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. And the first thing I want to do as we begin this study is I want to look at these two verses in a multitude of versions. Now, you are familiar with these two verses, but you might be surprised at some of the minor and sometimes some of the major differences between different versions. We are blessed to live in a society that has access to a plethora of different versions. It is a blessing because we get a broader understanding of what the original author meant. So let's look at these. King James Version, 1611. Let's, let's see what the King James translators thought. In the beginning, God created the heaven, notice singular, the heaven and the earth. And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. Sound familiar? New King James Version, just a few years ago. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. The earth was out, was out, without form and void, and darkness was on the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the Face of the waters, New Living Translation. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was formless and empty, and darkness covered the deep waters, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the surface of the waters. New Revised Standard Version, this is the one that I often preach out of, I, I appreciate it. In the beginning, when God created the heavens and the earth, the earth was a formless void. And darkness covered the face of the deep, while the wind from God swept over the face of the waters. NIV, very commonly used. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. Very similar. There's some minor differences along the way. I want to throw in one unusual one, one that many of you have appreciated, but it's, it's a paraphrase, but it hit me as something that made me say, hmm, you ever do that? Hmm, I like that, the message. First, this, God created the heavens and the earth. All you see, all you don't see, earth was a soup of nothingness. A bottomless emptiness, an inky blackness. God's spirit brooded like a bird above the watery abyss. I like it. I like them all. And each one adds its own little flavor. But I want to. I want to now. Go in a little bit closer and explore these verses in a bit more intimacy. The first words that you learn in Biblical Hebrew, if you're taking the Biblical Hebrew in college, or even if you get your own textbook and learn it, are these words. Bereshit bara. In beginning, God. These are the words that we memorize as we first face Biblical Hebrew as theology. And we've got the, uh, obviously, it's backwards. I don't know if you knew that, but in the beginning, create God's head, the heavens, and the earth. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. If you look at that first word, there is peace, there's more to it than meets the eye in some ways. There's two ways that you could translate this, two primary ways. It could be in the beginning, or you could say most importantly. The most important thing is that God created the heavens 
and the earth. Most important thing. In the beginning. In the beginning seems to indicate that that in the beginning there was God, not me. It puts our relationship in perspective. God is the eternal one, and I am not. In Psalm 90, verse 2, uh, Scripture says this, Before the mountains were born, before, or you brought forth the whole world, from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. In the beginning, God created them. But not only does it mean in the beginning God's created, but it also means most importantly, this is the main point. This is what's important. Remember this important fact. God created. In the ancient world, there were plenty of options for origin stories, as there are today. Moses and God want us to know that the origin of this world has a divine origin. Not one of violence among members of a pantheon as the Canaanites and later Greeks thought, and not the result of blind chance and random events as, as modern secular friends who would have us believe, but instead Moses wants his readers, including us today, to know first and foremost and most importantly, that there is a Creator who lovingly, carefully, purposefully, and personally formed the world that we live in. Most importantly, God made everything. There's been a lot of discussion over the when this happened, and I approached this topic with trepidation. So when of creation. Timelines have been traced and theories have been proposed. Genealogies have been recorded and math has been done. Dogmatic statements have been written and criticism has been thrown. But as we look at the next, the, the text of the first creation account, here from Genesis 1-1 until the beginning of Genesis chapter 2, verse 3, we see that there are only two time-conditional statements. Number one, in the beginning, God made the heavens and the earth. And number two, on the seventh day, God rested from his work. So when did God create? In the beginning. When did God finish creating? On the seventh day. This is where Scripture leads us, and we must follow. The most important thing is that God did create. God created. Before all else, there was God. Jesus alludes to this in John uh, 858. Before Abraham was, I am. Jesus was making a deep theological and experiential statement that he, the Savior, is eternal and is God. John first introduced this idea in the first verses of his gospel in John chapter 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was what? Was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life. Who in who? In the Word was life. And that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. We can't read that without verse 14. And the Word through whom everything was made, who is God and was with God, the Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us. We have seen His glory, the glory of the one and only Son, 
who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. Can't say it any better myself. Beautiful, beautiful writing. In the beginning, God. God. The word for God is Elohim. This word is plural. Some have posited that Moses was saying that there was a pantheon, a, a multiplicity of gods involved in this creation account. This would fly in the face of the rest of Moses' narrative. Instead, as we continue to explore Scripture, we begin to see that the one true God, God, is community himself. God has experienced relationship since before God ever created another being. Let me explain why this is significant, just briefly. We've talked about it before, we'll talk about it again. Very little is known about the pre-creation experience of God, but we can know that God existed and that God is love, that God must be eternally plural. Let me explain. Ty Gibson and others have beautifully described this necessity, but I'm going to recap it. If God were one individual, one person only, he would be self-possessed and self-obsessed. That is not love. If God were only two beings, there could be love, but it would be exclusive and possessive love. But if there are three, then there would have to be healthy, sharing love where one cannot be possessive of another, but had to share that love with another. There's much more that we could explore here, but I want to wait a few weeks. We'll come back to this concept. We'll visit this again. Suffice it to say for now that Scripture teaches that the God of Scripture Elohim is three persons in one Godhead. In the beginning, God. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Literally, the sky and the land. I'm not talking necessarily about a globe. That's not necessarily the, the focus, though I think that that could be extrapolated. But Moses is saying God made the sky and the land. This prefigures what God will do on days two and three of creation, where he creates the sky and the dry land. And then he fills it. In the beginning, God created the heavens, the sky, and the earth. The land. Now the earth was formless and empty. These are fun words. A little bit of Hebrew. Tohu, Zabohu. They rhyme. That B, Zabohu, it means and. So Tohu and Bohu. Being formless and empty. But there's more to it. It also means chaos and void. The rest of the creation story from this point on is God bringing order out of disorder, peace out of chaos, and purpose out of turmoil. And darkness covered the face of the deep. What a word picture Moses has painted for us. Before creation, before God stepped in, there was chaos and disorganization. It was just stuff that hadn't yet been worked with. But notice something now. Well, I want to talk about that for a moment. Tehom. And darkness covered the face of Tehom, of the deep. 
this seems to be a deep, empty place. And it's a, a, a situation where, where there is no life and there is this emptiness here. If we want to broaden our view just a little bit, if we, if we go to the book of Revelation, Revelation chapter 20, there's a significant point there where, where God's people, those who have chosen to follow Jesus, when Christ returns, he rescues them and, and takes them to heaven. And, and God leaves behind this empty place devoid of life. And as John sees this vision of this empty planet devoid of life, he thinks this looks a whole lot what what the pre-creation Earth would have looked like. And he goes back in his memory to Genesis chapter 1, and he takes the Greek translation of this word, deep, to home, and he lifts that out of Genesis 1, and he uses it to describe the post Rather, the post second coming earth. And he calls it abyss. An empty, deep place where there is no life. The void of God's creation. But this is what the world was like before God stepped in to, to take care of this space that he had set aside for a very special purpose at some point in eternity past. He says, I'm going to go back now. Now is the right time to take this space and to create it and to form it and to fill it and to organize it and to, and to create goodness out of chaos. I want to put something good here. I had plans for this long ago, and now is the time. And in the midst of this chaos, in the midst of this emptiness, in the midst of this deepness and darkness that God had planned for, even before He said anything, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. The Spirit of God was already there. In the midst of the darkness, before the first word was spoken to begin to create even light, God's presence was already there. Make you remember of an, another story in the New Testament. Thousands of years later, water was once again in chaos. Darkness was overwhelming. And a little boat's oars were hopelessly paddling against the waves as gale force winds whipped across the inland sea from the slopes of Mount Hermon. Water splashed over the sides of the vessel as twelve men bailed and flailed, hoping to somehow get to safety of shore. It was hopeless. I knew it was. These storms were brutal. The fishermen among them all knew people who had perished in such gales. But there was another among them. There in the chaos and darkness was a thirteenth man. Maybe, maybe he could grab an oar. Or maybe he could bail some water. Anything would help. Peter, gripping the tiller under his right arm, reaches over and takes the somehow sleeping form of the rabbi on the bench next to him. Jesus, wake up! We're drowning! Jesus' eyes open, sitting up and taking in the scene, the waves pouring in, the wind, rain, chaos, fear gripping their hearts. He sees it all. The Creator saw it all. Crouching low, hands firmly gripping shoulders, Jesus moved to the center of the wildly pitching vessel and reaching the mass. Jesus gripped it tightly and stands, hand outstretched. And the Word speaks into the chaos. Peace. Be still. The same God who spoke creation into existence. The same God who spoke order out of disorder. The same God in whom all things have their being spoke again. 
peace be still. And creation obey the Creator. Chaos calmed, the wind subsided, the clouds rolled back, the light of stars and moon once again shone, and God settled back on the bench where He had been resting. Chaos is not new in this world these days. We know that. Chaos is always threatened to invade our lives in this world. For the God who spoke into chaos and brought order and peace at creation, who spoke into the chaos of the storm on the Sea of Galilee, can speak order and peace into the chaos of our lives. Bringing stability and trust and hope and joy will last through all the storms of life. As the praise team comes forward, let me pray with you. Lord God, thank you for being a God who speaks and brings light and hope, peace and joy, order, trust, and all good things in the midst of our questions and doubts. May we trust you more today than we did yesterday. We love you. Amen.